Beginning in the 19th century, Western society has tried all the religious, coercive, medical, and compassionate solutions that we have on addiction, but the problem is, if anything, getting worse. Do we have to do more to address the social context of addiction and face the full implications of that realization? I will use the word uh, drugs and drugs frequently, and just, just as a shorthand, you'll understand that I, by that word I mean all the drugs that we read about in the newspaper, all the psychoactive drugs we read about, and alcohol. The drug problem is one of the defining features of our era. From the late 19th century, throughout the entire 20th century, and into the 21st, the world has devoted enormous amounts of intelligence, compassion, and money to the drug problem with very little success. The drug problem has increased rather than decreased over this long period, and it seems to be increasing faster in the UK right now than in most other places, and however, even faster in Russia, China, Iran, and a few other places. We have tried as a society all kinds of interventions, and we all know what they are. I, I think they're easily categorized into six. Preventing drug use, enforcing drug laws, that doesn't just mean arresting people for, as dealers or, or users, but also enforcing uh, drug laws in, in pubs and, and, and bars. Treating problematic drug users, reducing harm in habitual drug users, spiritual conversion, and self-help recovery groups, which I, th I think are more and more being called recovery communities. The relative importance of these six intervention types in local practice shifts dramatically from time to time. The reason that their importance shifts is that no matter how they are combined and which is given priority, the results are not nearly as successful as we want them to be. Although each of these types of intervention has helped many people who are afflicted with problem drug use, none of these six categories of intervention and no way of, in, of organizing the entire gang of six has helped the majority of problem drug users very much. And so the drug problem increases. In my corner of the world, uh, we call these six types of intervention the pillars of society's response to problem drug use. But this solid architectural metaphor of ours is illusory, I fear. Rather than pillars, it might be more accurate, more accurate to think of them as slender reeds upon which we place our hopes of overcoming the drug problem. Unfortunately, these slender reeds have bent almost to the ground under the weight of the problem and the weight of the heavy expectations that we have placed upon them. It is true that many dedicated professionals have devoted their life's energies to each of these kinds of intervention uh, with intelligence and compassion and every good intention. It is also true that each of these slender reeds has, has helped uh, large numbers of people. But in spite of this, <clears throat> the history of more than a century of intense and expensive effort in many different places shows us with near certainty that these six categories of intervention will never solve the problem. But the problem must be solved. So this brings, us, brings me back to the title of the talk, what, what to do when everything fails. Well, you know, generally speaking, there are three things to do. One is to give up. The second thing you can do when all else fails um, is to keep doing the same thing. The third thing which can be done, which I think is the preferred thing, is if shift, shifting the paradigm. Shifting a paradigm does not mean further changing and reorganizing the so-called pillars, but instead changing the foundational assumptions upon which they are based. I am convinced that the paradigm is now shifting. I see a new paradigm bubbling up from people who deal with drug problems on the ground, social workers, addiction counselors, street workers, and so forth. The new paradigm of addiction is not limited to drug addictions. Rather, it explains the full range of, of human addictions, whether or not any drugs are involved, whether or not the addiction is harmful in any obvious way, whether the addicted person is rich or poor, and whether the addiction is a minor irritation or a life-threatening tragedy. 
the primary focus of the new paradigm of addiction is not on single individuals, but on the mass addiction problem of the 21st century. When I talk about the new paradigm, I use the word dislocation as a name for the unbearable emptiness of people who have little to live for because they lack a secure and meaningful place in their society and in the world. Dislocation is more than a psychological emptiness. It is a spiritual emptiness as well. It is not just that dislocated people don't have friends. They are also emotionally estranged from their families and from humanity. They have little interest, pro or con, in the beliefs and values of their own society or subculture. They lack an identity that would connect them inwardly to any real people or places. They have no vision of either a meaningful future in society or a defining past. They feel no relationship to anything they consider natural, eternal, or sacred. To use a current blunt way of speaking, dislocated people don't have a life. To use a biblical way of speaking, dislocated people suffer from poverty of the spirit. To use one of the terms of the current economic crisis, dislocation is homelessness of the soul. Many dislocated people are poor and homeless in the normal sense of those terms, but dislocation is not the same thing as material poverty. Although material poverty can be a degrading condition in a world of wealth and affluence, it can also be born with dignity when people are able to confront it together as a psychosocially integrated society. By contrast, rich people in today's world are quite often severely dislocated and addicted. No increase in food, shelter, or wealth can restore their well-being since they already have all that money can buy. The lack of material necessities is normally called poverty, but dislocation is better called poverty of the spirit. Dislocation does not necessarily mean that people have been moved or relocated from one physical location to another. Although people who have been driven from their homelands as refugees or economic migrants often do suffer agonizing dislocation, dislocation is also the fate of many people who stay at home while their families, societies, and natural environments fall to ruin around them. For people who suffer from severe dislocation, addiction often provides the best available substitute for having a real fulfilling life. Addiction is a way of adapting to dislocation. Dislocated people do not love their addictions, but they need them desperately. This is one of the reasons that addictions are so hard to stop. We have societies which have been fragmented throughout modernity, really, and, and much more and more in the, in the last century or so. The consequence of that is mass dislocation, and that mass dislocation brings with it all kinds of symptoms social irresponsibility, depression, apathy, violence, suicide, child abuse. These are all things that people do when they're dislocated. And mass dislocation provides a, uh, a setting from which people adapt by addiction. And so mass dislocation leads to mass addictions. But also note that this is a feedback loop, that mass dislocations reproduce, mass addictions reproduce mass dislocation. People who are addicted um, often destroy the, the very relationships which are the most important to, to them in the first place, uh, increasing their, their mass dislocation. And also, addictions feed back to a fragmented society by making a society where people are more and more fearful. Or we could think of the addictions of very, very, very rich people, the kind of people who are so rich that, that they are willing to sacrifice their families, but also their, the, the financial stability of their countries. This way of looking at addiction is telling us that really the, the ultimate cause of, of addiction is a, is a fragmented society. Incidentally, this is not to disregard the fact that people have genes and people have different early experiences. But, but uh, it's to put that in the background and to say if we really look at the, the, the major cause, we will find it 
historically in this kind of, a, of an outlook. So what is a realistic goal? If this way of looking at addiction is right, what's a realistic goal for, for, um, for addiction? Well, I think a realistic goal is really to not have very much at all. I, I, one of my critiques, I guess, of, of all the, addic of the addiction literature now is so much of it is written in a spirit of resignation. We must always have this, but we can mitigate it a little bit. I don't think so. I think that if we, if we understand addiction, then we will understand that, that in the rapid social changes that are coming, there's the possibility for a, you know, there will be a new era. There is, we're on the verge of a new era, and it doesn't have to be an era which, which mass produces dislocation, as this one has. I think it is quite fundamentally important that we understand addiction is not a drug problem. It's a much bigger problem than that. It's a problem of this, of this dimension. And, and the kinds of things that people will be addicted to will be different. The internet provides a far more fertile ground for inventive people to, to develop new addictive um, substances or new addictive practices than does the drug world. Freedom is what drives the benefits of modern society. It drives our choices. It drives the fact that we live longer than any bef ever before. We're healthier than ever before. But one of the consequences of that freedom is the kind of dislocation that you talk about. You can't uncouple 100%. these two. Do you think, why, do, why are you more, posi more positive about that? Because I think the, the genius of, of societies that work is a balancing act. It's the balance of freedom and belongingness. Tribal group, for example, where, where addiction isn't even a possibility, it doesn't exist. It's not that you've given up all your freedom at all. It's that you live in a society where where there are all kinds of social constraints and commitments, but at the same time, there's all kinds of provisions for, for freedom. I think we've lost the balance. We've fallen over on one side of, the, of, that, of that balancing act, and, and uh, we have to get back to the balance. Putting aside uh, obviously harmful addictions, I guess one of the prospects of the future is that we do develop new forms of, of drugs which have fewer side effects and which are more subtle in their, uh, in their impact. Um, and, you know, you're not addicted to your glasses. It's there to deal with the fact that your eyesight is not as good as it should be and to use glasses. What is fundamentally different between the idea of your glasses and that we might live in a world where as a consequence of all the freedoms and benefits and advantages we get, a lot of people are on mild antidepressants to kind of keep them going along. Is that a terrible uh, vision? I mean, no. I, I, you know... No, we have to make a distinction between dependence and addiction. I mean. Everyone that I know is dependent on, on certain things. You've noticed my glasses. You, you might not have noticed my hearing aid. Um, yeah, dependence is simply part of life. But There's mood shifting. I'm saying that is it possible to imagine people being a uh, high level of, of addiction to, or low, uh, low level addiction, but to forms of mood enhancers, which are just ways of getting us through the modern world? Would that be such a bad thing? That's, that's reality. I mean, we, you know, we can have, a, we can have a, a beer after work, or we can, we can listen to, to music, which will shift our mood. Yes, we use... We're dependent on, on mood changers. Addiction is a different thing. Addiction is, a, is a, a whole involvement in which the rest of a person's life falls away to, to ruin. That's not okay. To be addicted to several hours a day of video games is a kind of problem. But to be addicted to becoming perfect at music, to playing the piano for several hours a day, uh, is not. I'm just interested in, in, in what basis upon, what's the basis upon which some people claim that playing video games is an incredible development, and there's some evidence that it actually enhances people's cognitive facilities in certain ways. W what is a way for us to be able to attest the difference between addiction, which, as it were, is connected with creativity and genius, and that we would applaud, uh, and that which we should see as being kind of socially destructive? We just have to let people tell us. Uh, in the case of video games, oh, certainly people can use a computer all day. I tend to do it myself, but... We have to not look for arbitrary signs. I mean, that's the thing. We're talking about addiction. We're not, we're, we're, not, we're not medicalizing it. We're not saying there's a diagnostic algorithm we can use here, which we say this is an addiction and this isn't. Well, well we, people bring their lives to us, and they say, I need some help, or I don't, I, you know, things fine. I'm, I'm okay. So uh, that's how I would answer your question.